Good day to you and welcome back to the Northeast Georgia History Center live stream presentation. I'm Marie Walker and today I'm going to be talking about open fire cooking. So uh, to do that I have of course my open fire and then I'm going to be making biscuits. So um, along the way I'm going to be talking about uh, basically just what I'm doing and how people back uh, in the, about the mid uh, 1800s would have lived. That's how I am dressed today and that is what I'm going to be talking about. Of course a lot of these practices date back to far older um, and some go uh, practices even survive today but usually we aren't doing it for our main meals. We have stoves for that but sometimes people do this uh, you know you use your cast iron when you go camping or something with your family so maybe you can do that uh, if you have a backyard camp out or something like that if uh, but be, for, be sure to check what fire is allowed in your area. Uh, and what codes are applied to that before you do anything of that sort. Uh, today we are out behind our White Path cabin, um, which people have lived in from its construction in the late 1700s up until the 1940s. It doesn't have a stove in it that uh, we have today. Uh, you have a hearth fireplace and then also you have this cooking circle out back. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of that before we start. Uh, I have my fire pit back here. A lot of times uh, it's kind of an interesting shaped fire pit and that's because it has a little spout on it which I can then take and rake my coals out on because the coals are what I'm going to be actually cooking on. I'm not going to be cooking over the open flame. I'm going to be cooking on the coals because that's the greatest source of heat. That is where the fire uh, lives, to, I guess. Uh, that's the heat source of it. So the, as you know, the flame is not actually the hottest part. The hottest part is the coals down where kind of the embers, the coals, the, the blue part of the fire. That is the hottest part of the fire and that's where we're going to be doing our baking. Uh, if you're trying to cook like soup or something or you're trying to boil water, sometimes you can do that over an open flame. It works all right um, if you're trying to cook a stew or just keep something warm. But for baking especially, we need the coals. Now we have the fire pit out back. Uh, some people think, uh, especially in the South, we have separate cookhouses where generally enslaved people would have cooked for larger families um, on a plantation or something of that sort. But you also have, you know, cookhouses sometimes in smaller houses that were uh, farmers that did not have enslaved individuals where they just would have cooked. Now, some people think that's because of fear of fire. And yes, that is the cookhouse has sees a lot more fire than just like your regular house. But if that was their only concern, they still have fireplaces in their own homes uh, because that's their source of heat. They didn't have central heating like we do today. You get your heat from your fireplace. So if that was their only concern was fire, well, it kind of is redundant to have fireplaces within your own home. And if you, so for people who live down south, you know what I'm talking about. It gets really hot down here, especially we're in northeast Georgia. In the summer, it's anywhere between 90 and 100 degrees on a given day. The main, one of the main things is heat. You don't want to heat up your entire house in the middle of the summer to bake your biscuits. You're going to take that outside where you have open air and fresh air, uh, or your cookhouse, which is smaller and is not going to eat up, heat up your entire main house. Of course, cookhouses were known to burn down far more often than regular houses just because of the nature of cooking. On the coals, you do that, the fire is going all day, could possibly be unattended, because what you have to do, you have to build the fire up way big in the morning so it bakes down or it uh, collapses upon itself so you have the coals to do your work on. Uh, so while our fire is getting the coals heat up, I'm going to be doing the prep work. Like I said, I'm going to be making biscuits. Right here I have my flour mixture. Uh, I did a lot of the measuring ahead of time, uh, but back then you don't always have measuring devices. A lot of it's just eyeballing it. So, oh it's blowing away. We have our uh, flour and baking powder mixture here. Um, and then I'm going to mix in my lard. Uh, the lard called for about uh, two, two things of lard about the size of an egg, which is not very specific, uh, but it gets the job about done. So this is my interpretation of how big I think eggs are. Uh, I guess my chicken lays about this size of eggs. 
and that's what I'm going to be putting oop, in here. Bacon gets messy. So I'm going to be working that in here. I prefer to work with my hands, especially with flour, just because it's more fun. And also I feel like I have better control over it. Um, so I'm going to be breaking apart the lard and mixing it in with the flour and get that dough going there. Uh, a lot of times you just use what you had, so substitutions could be made, you had to be creative. Uh, if we're going to talk about the White Path Cabin, which we're cooking behind uh, in the mid-1800s, which is the time period we're portraying, where do you get your food? You either grow your own food, you have your own livestock, which could help you produce your own food, uh, or you might go to a general store. In a lot of places, the general store could be right around the corner, or it could be a couple days ride. Uh, it's not necessarily specific. I do not know exactly for Gainesville where the general store would be. Uh, I'm sure we could find it on a map, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, this uh, White Path Cabin was also moved here, uh, so trying to figure out where it would be in location to that at this time, I'm not sure. But a lot of times people try to put their homesteads or uh, wherever they were building their houses, they would put it in at least like a couple days ride within the nearest general store because that's where your provisions are coming from. That's where your supply train is going to be. Uh, that's where you're going to get, like your supply train is going to go to. <clears throat> and therefore you need that to survive. So you're going to build at least uh, where you feel like you can ride there and get your necessary provisions uh, within a general amount of time. That isn't helpful for you. All right, so I got my lard pretty well worked in there. I'm now going to add my water. Sometimes you might make uh, biscuits with milk, like buttermilk biscuits or something of that sort, but we don't have milk, so we're using what we have, which is water. And then I'm going to work that in there. All right. I like to be able to work with it, uh, the dough, because once you feel the dough, you can feel a certain consistency. Yeah. The water, the recipe called for a certain amount of water. I think it's going to need more water. And that's why I have my bucket that I got from the whale. So we're going to go over and I'm going to dip my cup in my water pail. There we go. Let's try this. All right, do we have any questions so far that I can answer while I'm eating? No? All right. Well, if you have any questions, let us know. You can do so in the comments. We would love to hear from you. Well, Marie, what other types of meals might um, a person during your era make? All right, so we have the question of like, what other meals might a person uh, have during this time period. So stews were very popular. Call it, basically, it's whatever you have, you throw it in a pot, and that's your dinner for the night. That could contain different types of meat or vegetables um, that you might have had on hand or grown or gotten from the general store or traded with your neighbor for. All right, we're going to add a little bit more water here. Some meats that were probably popular, uh, you might have like turkey, like wild turkey or chicken. Uh, chicken is still a very large agricultural product in this part of the country. Can you repeat the ingredients you're using? Ah, yes. Yeah, so the ingredients I'm using is basically just flour, water, two egg-sized things of lard, um, and water. So that's a good question. Uh, lard is like a fat. It's kind of like a fatty portion of an animal uh, that you then use for baking. Uh, modern substitutes could be like Crisco or butter. 
uh, not really better, but Crisco is probably a very, the modern equivalent of what we have today. Um, well, I'm not sure if you're asking me where I got my lard or where you might get lard from in this time period, but if you were in the 1800s, you might get your lard uh, from butchering an animal, or you might get it from a general store or trade it with someone who had butchered an animal. All right, so I want my dough to be able to stick together nicely. I don't want it to have any like flaky parts uh, or parts that could flake off. Uh, and then I want all of the flour in the bottom of this bowl to also be gone. So leavening, um, the cookbook I was looking at said baking powder, uh, to use baking powder, so that's what I did, and therefore I assume baking powder would have been helpful at that time. Also, yeast, yeast has been around forever uh, if you want your dough to rise. We aren't using yeast necessarily. If I was making like biscuits or some type of bread, uh, like, a, a, like a loaf of bread, I would use that. But since I'm making biscuits, biscuits are a little different. They don't rise necessarily as much. So I'm just using baking powder. Um, so how much time would be, would it take for a woman to be cooking during this time? Um, she would get up early and start the cook fire. Um, like we talked about a little bit in the beginning of this episode, uh, episode, cooking, uh, would, you, you get up early, you start the fire, so the fire can be cooking down to the coals in time to bake breakfast. Um, and then you bake breakfast. You do the dishes from breakfast, you turn around, you prep for lunch, you make lunch, you clean up for lunch, you turn around and you make dinner, and then you clean up for dinner, and then you go to bed, and then you wake up and do it all over again. So a large part of a woman, well, that's just how life was back then, you didn't know uh, reasons for that would be child mortality rates were generally very high, and you did not know how many uh, of your children were going to survive. Um, and you needed your children to help you on the farm. They would be, they're good farmhands, they help you do chores. Um, so uh, the young sons, or the sons as they grew up, they would stay at the house um, and be taken care of because they are a child uh, until it was deemed they were ready to go help in the fields. And the girls, they would stay at the home and help the mother do the cooking, do the laundry, do the mending, um, and all of those things that we think of as more traditional, like gender role, female and uh, male things were dominated here, basically just to divide the labor, because all the things needed to be done, so um, it, they just that was their way of breaking down uh, how to get those chores done in their social structure. All right. The dough is looking pretty good here. It got it to a nice sticky point. I'm gonna put it down in the loaves here. All right, so I'm gonna go get my Dutch oven. And then we're going to start putting the biscuits in it. We're gonna try to get that unstuck for me as best I can. Should have got some extra flour to all my hands in. All right. Another reason why you have aprons is so you can clean your hands on them and keep your dress clean. So we're gonna do that. All right. So here we have my Dutch oven that I'm going to be baking the biscuits in. As you can hopefully see, uh, it has these little legs on it. So sometimes that's called like a spider, like a spider Dutch oven, or it's like a trivet that's just attached to it on the bottom. And that helps it sit down in the coals. 
uh, so it, the coals can get up under here and also have like a little room to breathe, which is nice because uh, we all know fire likes oxygen and helps that burn. Uh, right now I had it sitting kind of, uh, the idea of like warming the oven, I guess you would say, I had it sitting near the fire. So it's, it's not gonna burn me if I touch it, but it is warm, it's nice and warm. So when I put it in here, uh, my, my pot is already warm. Um, so then when I stick it on the fire, it can go straight to bacon. All right, here, let's see. I want you to see me roll the biscuit. So let's set this behind me. Now that you've seen that. So this is how my grandma taught me how to make rolls. But I think the same thing kind of goes for biscuits. You're going to get your biscuit off here, break off a little piece of dough, shape it into the shape of a circle. Uh, this is, I guess you make rolls because you roll them, but this is how I was taught. You make a little claw and then you put it over the dough and then you roll it. Oh, and I'm going to stick that in my Dutch oven here. Let's move this here and that here. There we go. That's a better way to do that. Uh, and then I will stick it down in the Dutch oven. I'm going to put it more towards the circle, uh, the sides, and I'm going to kind of make a circle and spiral in uh, to put my, my biscuits in there that way. And then we're just going to do the same thing over and over again. I'm going to space them out a little bit because I don't want them to touch and I have enough room to do that. All right, so we have a question was, uh, would folks make their own preserves and jams? And the answer would to that would be yes, if you had the berries or the things to do that. Um, that is a very common method of preserving those fruits for a later date. We actually have some preserves that we might put on these biscuits later, um, which would be very tasty, I'm sure. Um, also probably a little bit more of a treat because uh, those are nice and sweet. Uh, and not as easy to come by unless you just had your own bush, which you could definitely have had. Um, and other methods for preserving uh, meats and uh, foods, um, canning would be one definite thing that you could do to preserve your fruits and vegetables, which is when you, uh, in a nutshell, you boil all the it down and then you put it in jars that you vacuum seal because you put them in water and then because uh, they didn't have a vacuum then they didn't know what vacuum sealing meant but today we would call it vacuum sealing um, and you boil the cans as well and it's a whole long process uh, that you can do which would help you preserve like fresh fruits uh, not necessarily done for fruits but it's done for vegetables if you're doing fruits then you call them preserves and they're kind of more like jams or something um, Another thing that we think of today is like freezing them or putting them in the refrigerator or the ice box. Um, they did not have that back then. That's a new thing that's coming about at this time. Um, we actually get the term ice box because you had a large box and then people would go around with just large uh, sheets of ice that you can then have delivered to your house daily that would come off the boat from uh, way up north that would have to be shipped to you. And then that large block of ice would then be taken to different places that would have ice boxes and basically you put that large sheet of ice in a box with the th food that you're trying to preserve. Out here, frontier Georgia, we don't have an ice box yet. That's not coming to us for another another several decades. Here, I want to make this one a little bigger. My biscuits are getting a little small. <clears throat> So another thing that you might be able to do here is smoking your meat. Um, you might have heard of like smoke cured meat and that's when you hang your meat up and what you would, you would actually build a smoke house, um, which is a kind of just like a cabin looking room, a little smaller. Uh, you have, you would hang your meat up in the rafters and then you would have a large fire down below in the pit. Um, and then the smoke would go up and cure the meat. So you might have smoke cured meat or you might have salt cured meat, which is basically when you just rub salt all over your meat. Um, 
and Ah, yes. All right. So for those of you just joining us, welcome. We're so happy to have you. Right now I'm making biscuits or rolls because I'm rolling them. Uh, I originally was making biscuits, but I just like rolling things better. Um, and my ingredients that I have here is flour, baking powder. Uh, what else did I put in here? Oh, two egg-sized things, a lard, and water. So that's what we, that's what we have uh, in these little balls of dough. Those are what those are made of. Uh, I'm going to be cooking these um, in, on the fire in a little bit. Um, and when I say fire, I'm not actually going to be cooking them on the flames. I'm going to be cooking it on the coals because I'm going to be baking. Uh, we have this Dutch oven here with those little lovely uh, spider legs or trivets uh, that we have coming down here that I'm going to be able to set on those coals. I'm going to rake out of the fire. Um, we're going to have some lessons in fire tending in a moment as well. Because um, I want to make sure my fire doesn't go out, but we're, we're doing good on that. Um, it's baking or cooking down, which is what I want because I want to cook on the coals. Um, and then also I'll show you how, how basically the Dutch oven works. Um, it works very much like an oven that we have today, like a convection oven. Um, and I'm going to explain that a little bit more in a moment once I set these on the fire. I'm going around and I'm putting all my little rolled up pieces of dough. Oh no, they rolled away. I can't do that. Anyway, I'm placing them nicely around the Dutch oven. We're having to fix that there. All right. How did women learn cooking techniques? Ah, very good question. How did women learn cooking techniques? So, probably would have just been handed down in the kitchen. That's how basically I learned how to cook is, um, I think I told everyone uh, in a little longer while, a while ago is, you know, I, I learned how to roll uh, rolls from my grandma. You make it like a little bear claw and then you go in a circle here on the board. Um, that's how, where I learned that from. I'm sure she learned that from her mom and or her grandma. Um, so very much kind of like today, at least how it worked for, for me necessarily, uh, we learned from the older people in our lives and their hand down our cooking traditions because foodways is a large part of culture. A large part of our culture is our food that we have or your traditional dishes. Like, you know, you think of like your favorite dish that your mom makes you um, or your favorite dish that your grandma makes. Like for my, my family, my grandma makes the most amazing pies and we love, love, love her pies. And that's like a large part of our family gathering is we get very excited when dessert comes around and grandma has made a pie. Um, just like that, that happened through the centuries to today. Food is a large part of people coming together and celebrating or just surviving. Um, so uh, it's handed down around the mid 1800s people are becoming more literate. You also have cookbooks for some of the first time um, that also have some cooking techniques in them um, and some recipes, which are very interesting. Um, some of them have some interesting ways of measuring and some interesting ways of, they can't say heat the oven to however degrees hot. It's like, well, if you hold your hand in the oven or over the flame and you can do so for 10 seconds or 30 seconds or a minute, then it's about hot enough. Um, which is just, it's a large thing of, I think people just kind of, they knew. They were cooks and they knew that the fire was hot enough or they knew it wasn't. Um, and measuring was a new concept. Um, you had experimental cooks in the kitchen like you do today. I know I like to experiment sometimes. Uh, you also had to be very creative because if you didn't have something that a recipe called for, well, how do you implement some type of substitute? You had to work with what you had, especially uh, in a time where supply chains are not always the most reliable of things. And uh, you just kind of had to work with what the land gave you or what you had on hand. Like I said, sometimes you might make biscuits with milk. We didn't have milk, so we used water today. Um, and that's how that is working for us right now, which I think should work out pretty well. I mean, it made a good good consistency of dough. I'm gonna do my final arrangement 
for my little dough pieces down here. Ooh. That is a good question. Um, so the question was, what type of comfort food might you have at this time? I'm trying to think. Um, I, I don't think the idea of like southern comfort food was necessarily a thing at this time, like the idea of it. Because um, today, I, when I think of southern comfort food, I think of like mashed potatoes and barbecue and mac and cheese. Um, I don't think mac and cheese was a thing during at this point. Barbecue definitely was. Um, and mashed potatoes were also a thing. Potatoes are a hearty, stable crop that keep for a very long time if you keep them in dry, neutral places. They last forever and they help people uh, survive famines uh, to an extent because they, they are hardy. They are hardy, hardy root vegetables during this time. But if I had to think of something that might be like a treat during this time, I would think of probably like pies or some type of like sweet pastry, some type of something that had sugar in it. Uh, if I had to think of something that was just like a staple that they've had forever and therefore was a comfort food, I would think of something probably more like a stew. That would be hearty, probably would have potatoes in it, uh, some type of meat, uh, like a hearty stew uh, would be what I would assume might, they might have had that might have been like, ah, yes, this. This is what I have a hankering for or something of that nature. Did men ever cook? Of course they did. Uh, they definitely cooked. Um, if you were out in the army on your trail uh, and you did not, like, you might have a, a male chef or a male cook that goes with the army, or you might just be on your own and you had to do it yourself. Um, if a man found himself without a wife and young daughters who were under, you know, I wouldn't today, I would still not let a three, a three year olds don't know how to cook and they don't know how to use a fire, they would have to then assume that duty and cook. Uh, so of course men cooked, it was generally thought of as a tr more traditional female role, but that does not but under any circumstances mean that men did not cook. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, documentation and stories where men uh, were thought of as probably slightly more uh, like chefs or cooks that would then go out and work um, and serve like Queen Victoria or um, like restaurants that were starting, that was starting to become a thing at this time, uh, was going out of your home to eat. Uh, besides, that was, it's always been necessarily a thing like in taverns and such, you could go and get a meal. Uh, but the idea that we have kind of a restaurant is beginning to bloom in this time uh, and then will continue to do so uh, as time progresses. Ah, so the time period that we are talking about like today right now is mid-1800s, so 1850, 1860s um, that we have, that I am portraying today. All right, so I have all of my little balls of dough positioned how I would like in my Dutch oven, and I'm going to put my lid on. And I'm going to take it over to the fire. And then I'm also going to grab my fire tools because we're going to do some fire tending. All right, this is my bucket of water in case everything goes badly. Uh, which we're going to move there so I don't knock it over. All right. So here I have my fire. So I'm going to, it's nice and hot, and I'm going to attempt to not get smoked out. I'm told smoke follows beauty, so that's supposedly a compliment, but I don't want it right now. All right, there we go. On this side of the smoke. Honestly, I could just push these to the side. Sometimes I rake it down there, but right now, I have a nice bed of coals right here in the middle, which is kind of what I built this fire to do. So we're just going to knock these two out from under the way, nice bed of hot coals right here. Really nice bed of hot coals. And I'm going to take my pot, and I'm going to position it here in the middle. 
Whew. All right. That looks good. So you now might have noticed this pot has a bit of a lip to it on the lid, on the ridge. And that's because uh, it acts as kind of like a little, little pot hold, uh, it's going to hold my coals. So what I'm now going to do, now that I have coals all around it, I'm going to actually put coals on top of my, whew, coals on top of my pot. And this makes it work as a convention, convection oven because it has coals on top and on the bottom. All right, so the question is, how would people get water during this time? So if you live near a creek or a stream or something of that nature, you could get it from there. That's a fresh water source. What a lot of people had to do was dig wells. So depending on how far the water table is below you, you would have to dig down really far and hope you hit water. Um, there is a whole science to it that I'm not necessarily sure about, but one of the ways I think is more interesting and somehow works sometimes, I don't know necessarily the majority, I don't think there's necessarily been a study done on it, but is like if you get a divining rod, which was sometimes used, and that's, I don't have a stick to show you, but you know how sometimes you see like a, like a stick that has like a V and then like a, a stick coming out of it as a branch. So you hold on to the V part and then you walk around with the stick part pointing towards the ground. And then whenever you feel your V getting closer together, that means you're over a spot. That means you, that, that has water under it and you don't have to dig down as far to get the water for your well. I, I know some people who they, they think they have the gift of water divining or divining trying to find water. Uh, I've never seen it happen before, uh, but uh, it's definitely a thing that people uh, use to attempt to find water in the ground uh, and just to dig wells. Uh, you would then sometimes, once you dig the well, sometimes people just put a board over it that uh, then you would have to you know, shift the board, and then you would get a bucket with a rope on it and put it all the way down and then pull it all the way back up. And then you would have your one bucket of water that you could then use for washing, cooking, uh, whatever you wanted to do with your, your bucket of water. And that's majority of how people got their water. Did you make your dress? Ah, yes. Okay, so we had the question of if I made my dress, and yes, I did. Um, this is what you would have as your work dress. So. Uh, basically, you don't want to stand around a fire with a hoop skirt on. Uh, one of the fashionable things at this time was a bit, the big pretty hoop skirts um, were very fashionable in the mid-Victorian era in the 1850s, 1860s, which is the time we're portraying today. You would, you would not, under any circumstance, go cook out in a fire wearing a hoop skirt under any any circumstances because you will catch yourself on fire. If you think about it, you, you have a skirt that you are not necessarily, that's not attached to your body. You don't have the feeling of the fabric. You, you catch yourself on fire so easily. Some, there's a lot of people, uh, I think they, the leading cause of death at this point was women dying in childbirth and then from accidentally catching themselves on fire. Because if you had a hoop skirt and you're just, you're cold and you're standing with your back to the fire, the back of your skirt can light on fire really fast. Um, of course, they had natural fibers that they made their clothing out of at this time. Uh, synthetics like polyester were not available, which they burn faster and they don't melt to your skin uh, when they catch on fire. So you have slightly better chance that way of noticing that you're on fire and putting yourself out because they don't, if you're wearing something like wool, it doesn't necessarily burn as fast as polyester. But uh, still, a large problem. So I'm wearing a work dress, which means 
I do not have a hoop on under it. I have a corded petticoat, which keeps the skirt from like getting uh, all twisted around my legs because that would also be bad for work. Um, if you would like to see, I'll, I'll show you, which might be a little scandalous, but this is my corded petticoat, uh, which keeps uh, my skirts from getting all tangled up there. And it holds it out just a little bit, but not a whole lot. Uh, some ladies, they would wet the whole hem of their skirt before they started cooking in an attempt to keep themselves from catching on fire. I did not need that. I, am, I like to think I, I've been doing this for a long time and I have not caught myself on fire. Uh, therefore, I like to think I know what I'm doing. But also I think it's rather impractical, uh, especially if it's like colder outside or just colder in your house. You don't want to get yourself all wet to, to just to cook. You, you would want to stay warm. Uh, also, you would have to go out and draw more water from the well in order to get your skirt wet because you can't just turn on the faucet. Another reason people didn't fully submerge themselves in bathe, they weren't just nasty. It's also a lot of work to fill up a bathtub if you have to go to the well and then crank up bucket after bucket of water. Can we talk about the advances in cooking and techniques and methods of maybe from the time of before your All right, so the question is about time uh, cooking. So like what some of our advances might have happened at this time. I don't think a whole lot really happened from like the 1700s to the 1800s. It's pretty much the same technique. Some food might have happened a little bit. Yes, uh, we have a question? What did the rich people eat? <laughs> ah, what did rich people eat? So rich people are going to have far fancier things. They might have like chicken and duck and goose and uh, some of those fancier fowl birds. Uh, they're going to have it nice, much uh, more nicely presented uh, on nicer china, nicer garnishes or pretty things around uh, than you might have out here on like the frontier, more or less, then uh, they probably aren't going to be eating stews that are just, you know, whatever you have in a pot thrown together. They're going to be following more recipes France was incredibly fashionable at this time, so uh, French dishes have lots of like sauce that go with them, uh, and there are lots of different spices and such. So you would have like finer things like that. Sugar is expensive, spices are expensive, seasoning, uh, which is spices, expensive. So rich people are going to have a lot more of that because it's expensive. So how would the foods have been bland? Uh, so the question was, would these foods have been bland? Probably, depending uh, depends on what your definition of bland is. I feel like that's a very hard like definition. Um, they, they would have had things like salt and pepper. Uh, salt is a preservative, so you're going to have salt. So it's going to have some flavor. Also, think about this. Everything's cooked over an open fire, and that means everything has that kind of smoky taste to it as well, which I think Sometimes you don't get that in a modern day oven. And that adds a certain amount of flavor and it brings out a certain amount of flavor. So I think they're just going to be different, not necessarily bland, but also you have a lot of English people and English food is also considered bland um, who are settling in America at this time. So it might just be their tradition of what they like. What would men have worn on a daily basis? Ah, so the question would be what men wore during a ba daily basis on this time. So if you're talking about like, um, like out here, like what would my counterpart look like? Um, they would be wearing like wool pants that have a higher waist. They would be at their natural waistline, which is where like my apron is at my natural waistline. Um, and then they would have probably a shirt that could be patterned or white. Um, it would have uh, buttons down the front. It's not going to have any type of fancier frills and they might have um, a vest on. Uh, probably if they were out working, they wouldn't necessarily have one, but if they were, trying to look spiffy. Um, they might have a vest on, like that, uh, if they were going to go to town or go to meeting or something of that nature. They would dress it up a little bit. They might wear suspenders, um, probably would wear suspenders, keep their pants up. Uh, nowadays we have like belts, and they had belts back then too, but suspenders were more or less uh, used to that fashion. And then they would have like their leather boots that would look very much like mine, uh, but they might have like a lower, uh, lower thing, it wouldn't go as far up there, like, yes. What would the men be doing while the women were cooking? All right, so if women <clears throat> were thought of to tend the house more, tend the children. Looks like a dream. You can find any taste of away from the wind, away from the 
Oh, away from the wind. Okay, we're going to attempt this. Is this better? A little bit, yeah. yeah. All right. <clears throat> so if people were to, um, is this, does this help at all? No? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so what would men be doing if women were here cooking a good part of the day? They would be out on the fields. They could be, you know, working the farm, working the fields, uh, planting, plowing, harvesting, depending on what time of year we're talking about. They could also, if they were involved in some sort of trade, they could be a blacksmith or a carpenter, uh, which a blacksmith works with metal, carpenter works with wood. They could be doing something uh, of those trades as well. And I'm going to go, I'm going to rotate uh, my pot here. So it cooks evenly. Uh, not all coals are created equal. I'm just going to use my hook and I'm going to rotate it. I'm rotating the top part um, and that way hopefully everything evens out, evens out in my cooking. I'm also going to just use my hook. Oh, here. And move this around a little bit as well. Um, I think I started this about an hour before I started cooking and I'm just cooking one pot that has like, I didn't even count how many rolls I had, less than a dozen and it's bread. So it's not, it's not like I'm trying to cook meat or anything. Um, so I didn't have to start it that long before, but probably about an hour or so, I think. All right. So this is my handy fire, one of my handy fire tools. It has a little hook on the end that I'm not going to touch because I just stuck it in fire. And that helps when I'm trying to like pick up the thing here, like the lid. Oh, and see, so, oh, they're looking really good. Uh, peeking, you have to peek a lot at your, at your things. They're almost done, I think. They need just a little bit longer. They're gotten to a golden part, but I want them to get brown around the edges. <clears throat> uh, oh yes, but then also this is a multi, multi-faceted fire tool, because not only does it have the hook that I can use to lift the lid and such, because I am not going to touch it, because that is full of coals, um, and I can use it to lift this, because that's going to get really hot. It also is hollow, and I can, still stand a large amount away from the fire and blow because it's a fire blower as well. Whew, I just got some smoke in my eyes. Uh, but that's, it's helpful that I can stay at least this far away from the fire, um, around the fire pit, uh, but also uh, blowing into it, uh, giving the fire that air helps stir the coals, stir the fire um, and make sure it doesn't go out. Um, right now, I didn't really care about my fire going out because I'm not going to be using it after I do these coals uh, or use these coals which have gotten hot enough from the fire. So I didn't necessarily, otherwise, I w uh, if I was going to keep using this fire, that's when I would have shoveled these coals down and out of the fire and left the fire going and I would have stocked it with more wood to keep the fire going, to keep coals going so I would have it for the next meal. Uh, but since that is not the purpose of our demonstration today, I just spread the fire out. We're going to be putting it out anyway afterwards and then stuck the pot down there. Yes. Oh, almost everything. I feel like a Dutch oven is like a catch-all of great pots and pans to have. Uh, I've cooked stews in Dutch ovens. Uh, I've cooked meat in Dutch ovens. I've cooked bread in Dutch ovens. I feel like bread is probably the best um, in a Dutch oven. Like you could, you can technically cook anything in a Dutch oven. I've cooked meat more in like a cast iron skillet before if you want to kind of like fry it or cook it like that. But uh, yeah, pretty much you could try anything. Do you have any tips and tricks for new people to open fire cooking? Uh, yeah, so that's uh, tips and tricks to open fire cooking. Um, 
I'm trying to think like what what would be like what I would say. What would be like the like the best advice I would have? Um, my uh, let's see. Depends on like where you're cooking it. If you're using like a fireplace, um, like the hearth, because it's called like open hearth cooking. It's not necessarily like fire cooking. Um, is raking the coals like from the fire in the fire pit uh, out to the hearth and then cooking them on the hearth. Uh, for some reason, that blew my mind when I took my open hearth cooking class. I was like, oh wait, we don't cook over the fire. We cook over the coals. Like wow, like that makes sense now that you say that. But like. I, you know, in movies and stuff, you already see, you always see people over this large fire cooking, um, but not necessarily over that. Uh, check on it a good bit. Uh, it takes a little bit of experience to know, like, I think this hot of fire is going to cook it that fast. Um, setting it, you always want to keep an eye on it. I think if, uh, there's not like you can set a timer and then walk away and then go back to it at this point. Uh, so just keeping an eye on it, uh, not catching yourself on fire, staying a safe distance. Oh, that's what, good. What about spending to the coals of the fire? Any advice there starting? Um, okay, so starting a fire, oh, that's a whole thing, is building different types of fires to get different types of results. Um, <clears throat> so to keep... So like I said, if I wanted to, uh, if I was going to try to keep this fire going, which I'm not, uh, raking the coals out of the fire, so shoveling the coals out of the fire, and then keep wood on it constantly, um, letting it burn down. Um, and then also you want to keep the coals in the fire until you're ready to use them. So you don't want to be like, oh, well, I'm going to use these coals later, because if you shovel them out of the fire, then they're going to lose their, their, their heat, uh, and they're not going to be as good. Uh, coals are always good for starting a fire. Uh, if you have like coals from the last fire you did, like we had some in the fire pit, I scooped them all up and I stuck them in the middle of the fire I was building because they're good to catch fire again if you have those, those coals. Uh, that wood's also really good for starting fires if you're trying to do it the old timey way, um, unless you're not using like, you know, modern start a fire. Uh, fat wood catches very nicely. It's always kind of fun to also see the sap boil out of it. I was amused by that when I started my fire today. Uh, yeah, so I would suggest that. What other resources would you recommend to folks that want to learn more? Um, to learn more about open fire cooking. Um, or how to do it. So I learned from a woman named, uh, who, who taught me almost a large amount of what I know about historical fashion and uh, cooking, uh, Miss Martha. Um, I volunteered at, um, it's called State Leo's Plantation, you can still go visit it, it's down in Jonesboro, um, and they had an old cookhouse, and we had a cooking class that she taught a large amount of us uh, how to go do it. So honestly, I would recommend finding someone who knows what they're doing and then just asking them everything, uh, asking them to teach you or uh, figuring out if there's a class somewhere that you could go to. I'm sure you could also find videos online. Townsend and Son has a good cooking uh, videos, but they're more colonial America, um, and they have a wonderful setup that doesn't sometimes involves an open fire, but sometimes they have built their own like oven, uh, which is really cool, but uh, not necessarily Foxfire steam fire. Uh, Foxfire Museum? Yes, they have lots of classes. Ah, Foxfire Museum has a lot of classes, I am told. I have not experienced that, but you can also go look that up. I'm going to check on this again. Oh, it's so close. We want to know more about the types of desserts that were back then. Ooh, all right. So types of desserts. Um, what would you have? You could have like cakes or pies or puddings. Uh, so pudding, like we think of today, is like like kind of like the gelatin, jello stuff. Uh, pudding back in this time, like if you think of like. Uh, give us the figgy pudding from the Christmas song or Christmas carol, Christmas song. Um, it, it's a different, it's not like the pudding we think of today. It's more, it has more substance and more fruit in it. <clears throat> um, I think down at the governor's mansion in Georgia, which uh, the old governor's mansion that is, was, it's one of the most wonderful examples of Greek revival architecture I've ever seen. 
and they have their kitchen and their basement interpreted. Um, they have a bunch of fake food. One of the most impressive to me was they had this giant, giant pineapple cake that would take up it's bigger than this table. Um, so things could get very lavish. They would have like, uh, this pineapple cake had like sugar, like that type of hard, that sugar that like gets hard um, and then you can make decorative things out of it, like that kind of frosting uh, covered in different types of things. And this cake was to emulate a cake that Queen Victoria had at her court. Um, so large cakes, pies, uh, different things of those natures would be desserts. Yes. Is there anything that was made during this time or became popular during this time that we still have today? The Victorian era created lots of different trends um, and uh, foods that we then still hold dear uh, today. Um, I can't think of any one specific food that like just exploded during this time that we still like really, really love. Uh, but around this time, uh, potatoes were a large topic uh, because you have in the 1840s, 1850s, you have the Irish potato famine, which had become such a staple in their diet. And then a lot of other large political factors that led to this, uh, this famine. Uh, but one of which being the blight of the potatoes. Um, the potato being such a staple of the diet and such a good hearty vegetable, uh, root vegetable. <clears throat> uh, that's one thing that I could think of, like the potato. Of course, this, the potato came over from the, the new world to the old world uh, when we had the, all the trade started back in the uh, 1500s, 1600s. Um, and that had then become like a staple of the diet that just carried through Europe. I still love eating potatoes, so I guess to today. <sighs> All right, um, I think we almost might be done. I'm going to check them one more time because we're getting so, so close to them being done. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take this off. All right, I think they're done. I'm going to leave this here because it's we're going to let that cool off for a bit. I'm going to go ahead and shake these off and leave that there. All right. They turned out being more like rolls than biscuits, but I think that's okay. Uh, I like those better anyway are very fun. I can't lift this up to show you right now. Um, or maybe I can. Let's see. If I can use it like that. Oop. All right, there we go. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right, so that's the end result of uh, this biscuit making over the open fire. As you can see, they really, they, there was, there's not really a flame left. It's just the coals that are producing their heat. Um, and then having it over and under, they smell delicious. I know you can't smell them through the camera, but they smell wonderful. Uh, there's nothing quite like cooking in a Dutch oven. Even if you cook in like cast iron today in your own uh, oven, it just, there's a different flavor to it. Uh, because you have to like season the pan and all of that stuff. And then also just, it. Cast iron kind of contains and holds the flavor of whatever was cooked in it before, maybe five times before. Uh, and I feel like it just kind of adds, it's just fun. So let's see. Um, yeah, they're kind of like a nice golden, golden, they didn't get brown on the edges like I was kind of thinking they might, uh, but I'm not mad about that. They're still pretty good. So let's see. I'm going to check the bottoms to make sure they didn't get like burnt. Oh, oh, no, okay. There we go. It has like that perfect little golden brown on the bottom. And then here we have it on the top. Uh, hopefully this is, you can see this a little better now. Um, we kind of did this little like cracking thing, but that's okay. Uh, this type of biscuit, 
you could be used um, ter in traditional southern breakfast uh, you have like biscuits and gravy and then like some type of like ham or bacon like some type of pig uh, pig meat <laughs> uh, with breakfast works back then as it did today oh this okay this is an interesting experiment so uh, remember I just showed you the one uh, thing that looks almost like perfect on the bottom well okay this one's burnt <laughs> because you do not this is a lesson in not all fire is created equal even that's why I tried to rotate it because some spots are going to be harder than others uh, but this is this is just burnt this looks like a charcoal um, but obviously not all of them are burnt which is a fun thing that different from open fire cooking from like cooking today because if you stick a sheet of cookies in an oven today and you forget about them they're all going to be burnt over this one could just be per cooked almost perfectly like the one i showed you and then one can look like that uh which is just you know it's a fun different experiment and yeah because one side one side looks really good and then one side is more done than the other like they're all they're all edible um but it's just fun lessons in open fire cooking. Uh, not, it's not all going to be the same, same uh, cooking temperature by any means. All right, well, we'll have to end it there. And if you wouldn't mind letting people uh, know that we will be rolling out digital memberships. Ah, yes. All right. So thank you uh, so much for coming today. If you liked this and are interested in seeing more cooking demonstrations, let us know in the comments. We'd like to go back and read those. I'm Marie Walker, thank you so much for joining us. Hope to see you next time. A lot of folks ask me what it's like to work here, and I love it, but there are some things that take getting used to, especially when it comes to actors. Our liberty must be maintained, preserved, and inspired for all time! Alright, Glenn, it's time for a sound check. Who? Surely you mean President Adams? See what I mean? Excuse me, President Adams, we need to do our sound check. Sound check? Why would you check my sound? Are you some sort of tyrant again? All right, we're good, Mr. Adams. President! Glenn! Genius's sorrow's child. Hey everyone, Libba Beecham here, director of the Cottrell Digital Studio at the Northeast Georgia History Center. I've been with the History Center since 2017, and it has been such a rewarding job. I remember when we first began our live Zoom webcasts with students and teachers all over Georgia, and feeling that we were really on to something special. When the pandemic hit, and we had to close our doors in early March, it was a strange feeling, because we were concerned, for sure. As a nonprofit, we rely on our on site educational programs, our events, and of course our visitors to sustain us. But at the same time, we were more than prepared to start offering virtual programs for the public from day one of our closing. And for 10 weeks, we offered live stream programs every weekday. Our very first being a live stream with Girl Scouts founder Juliet Gordon Lowe, portrayed by yours truly, with an audience of over 400 Girl Scouts and their families. And since we've reopened, we've offered free live streams every Wednesday and members live streams every Friday, thanks to our new digital membership option, which is only $3 a month or $35 a year, by the way. Our audience has grown so much since then, and the response to our live stream programs has been so positive. I speak for all of us at the History Center when I say that you have helped us make the most out of this challenging time by watching our programs, participating in the chat, commenting, emailing, calling us with your kind remarks, writing us letters. You really do help us realize the value of the work we do here. Today, I am asking for your support in another way. Your donations today go toward furthering our mission and any amount is appreciated. And there are lots of great thank yous for your donation. So please give today at the link below, or you can call Leslie over the phone at 770-297-5900. Stop by or mail us a check to 322 Academy Street Northeast, Gainesville, Georgia, 30501. Thank you so much. And as they say, the show must go on.